while men are seen as leaders no matter what their age, women are often still, unfortunately, seen for their roles as caretakers in the home. So younger women are viewed as needing to care for young children. Or even if they don't have children, they might get pregnant. <laughs> That's the view that some of these women expressed that they had heard. Middle-aged women are viewed as needing to care for older children and perhaps even their parents. And then older women, oh my gosh, they might have grandchildren. <laughs> so well, men also have kids and they also have parents. It's women who are assumed that they need to firstly prioritize their care work. Hi, and welcome back to the New Rules of Business by Chief. I'm Carolyn Childers. And I'm Lindsay Kaplan, and we're the co-founders of Chief, the most powerful community of senior executive women. And on this podcast, we challenge preconceived notions of leadership and how underrepresented communities, particularly women and women of color, are specifically impacted. This week on the podcast, we're asking a question that is often at the top of my mind. Is there ever really a right age to be a woman at work? Yeah, I think that question is at the top of a lot of our minds as we navigate our careers. It's like if you're in your 20s or 30s, you're seen as too young to have any real power. If you're middle-aged, you're seen as someone with a little bit more experience, but who maybe is devoting more time to her family than her work. And if you're older, whew, you're seen as someone who already passed their prime, and therefore you're no longer worth investing in for growth. Yeah, I can honestly feel too young and too old within hours of each other, depending on which meeting I'm in and who I am talking to. But the reality is that age-related discrimination can happen at any age for women. Yep. As exhausting and untrue as these stereotypes are, there are steps we can take to dismantle the bias and make the workplace better for everyone. That's what we're diving into this week with our guest, Dr. Amy Deal. Amy is a gender bias expert who is the author of Glass Walls, Shattering the Six Gender Bias Barriers, Still Holding Women Back at Work. Her writing has appeared in Harvard Business Review, Fast Company, and Miss Magazine, in addition to numerous scholarly journals. I talk with Amy about a study she recently conducted where thousands of women of all ages weighed in on their experiences with ageism at work. Plus, we talk about aging corporate boards, queen bee behavior, and her thoughts on all of those 30 under 30 lists. Take it away. <laughs> Hey, Amy. Hi, Lindsay. Great to meet you. I'm obsessed with this topic, so I'm glad we can dive in because there's a lot here to unpack, and it's, it's a conversation that comes up a lot at Chief, both with our members who are typically late 40s into 50s, mm -hmm. as well as a lot of women on my team who are in their 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. So excited you could be here. I want to talk about a quote that I've said before that you actually can validate with a study. And that quote is, there is no right age to be a woman. Mm -hmm. I know we're going to dig into how ageism shows up for younger women, for middle-aged women, but I do want to quickly touch on ageism for older working women mm -hmm. because this quote really stood out. While men become wells of wisdom as they age, older women are seen as outdated, harpy, and strident. And one physician told you in your study that our voices are discounted. Mm -hmm. What are the consequences of discounting the experiences of older women? And why does this bias happen to just senior women and not men? Going into this study, we honestly, we expected to see ageism against older women. That's how ageism is typically thought of in the United States. It's illegal to discriminate against people over the age of 40. So it wasn't surprising to us. But what was surprising was the women's comments and their reports of the ages and that they were experiencing that their male counterparts of the same age weren't. And so the consequence of discounting the experiences of older women is that they have a wealth of experience as well as an understanding of their own generation. So it's really reprehensible when we throw all that aside because a woman is considered too old and not worth investing in. But at the same time, we see quote that you just mentioned, older men are seen as mature leaders and they are seen as still having value. And it's all due to stereotypes, right? And you think about even in the United States political system, how our presidents just keep getting older and older yeah. and they're campaigning for an office. They really don't have to cover up their gray hair. President Joe Biden is 80. Senator Sanders is 81. Their age doesn't keep people from voting for them. But yet Hillary Clinton is five, six years younger than them. She's 75. 
And she had to keep up a coiffed look without gray hair while she was campaigning for president in order to still appear vital and healthy and young enough to do the job. So gray hair on men can look distinguished, but on women it's seen as old and no longer vital. And my example there was from our political system, but it really is the same in our businesses and organizations in terms of how women are perceived in comparison to men. And there's so much power in studying this bias Mm -hmm. that you talk about in your book, Glass Walls. Mm -hmm. It's easy for all of us to internalize all of those different biases and believe that it's our fault. I know Mm -hmm. I've personally felt like I enter a room sometimes and if I feel young, maybe Mm -hmm. I feel less experienced. And so your data actually found a larger pattern about stigmatizing women at any age. What are some of these reasons behind the stigmas and stereotypes? So that was probably the most powerful aspect of our study because the pattern became clear when we were reading all of the women's answers. We had two questions that related to identity factors that impacted women's experiences. These were open-ended survey questions. And as we were reading through the responses, we would see one woman would say, I was told I'm too old to lead. The next woman would say, I was told I'm too young to lead. And then the third woman would say, well, I'm middle-aged and I'm seen as old anyway. So whereas my male counterpart is seen as a mature leader or in his prime. So it just became really clear really quickly as we started reading through these responses that no age was the right age, right? And really because it's happening to women of all ages, it's really just a guise for the underlying sexism. It's based on stereotypes of women and men. So while men are seen as leaders no matter what their age, women are often still, unfortunately, seen for their roles as caretakers in the home. So younger women are viewed as needing to care for young children. Or even if they don't have children, they might get pregnant. (laughs) That's the view that some of these women had heard. Middle-aged women are viewed as needing to care for older children and perhaps even their parents. And then older women, oh my gosh, they might have grandchildren. (laughs) So while men also have kids and they also have parents, it's women who are assumed that they need to firstly prioritize their care work. While it really should be something that we assume that people of all genders, both men and women, equally share. But it really is just an excuse to continue with the same old, same old. And that's not promoting women so that male control of institution continues. Yeah, it's interesting. We don't have those stereotypes when we look at young men or Mm -hmm. men who are recently engaged. We don't get nervous about them having kids. And it very much plays into the fact that women, even women who are the breadwinners in their home, Mm -hmm. are always the caregivers. The lion's share Mm -hmm. of caregiving with both children, with aging parents, is done by women. And so the stereotype persists because we put women in this position where they are forced to do all of this extra labor at home Mm -hmm. and they pay for it in the workplace as well. Yes, that's absolutely right. So what is youngism? How do the stereotypes against young women hold women back? In addition to this bias that they're going to be in the middle of these childbearing years, Mm -hmm. what else occurs when we think about women being too young in the workplace? So youngism is age bias against younger adults. And typically, or at least for our study, we had defined younger women as being under the age of 40. But it's really fueled by the conflation of age with maturity and the misperception that tenure is required for competency. And again, I mentioned this earlier, in the United States, age discrimination is covered for people over the age of 40, but not for people under the age of 40. So there's no legal protection for discriminating against someone because they are of a younger age. But the stereotypes that happen to women that are fueled by the youngism discrimination include something my co-author Leanne Dubinsky and I have termed as role incredulity. Hmm. So role incredulity occurs when women hold a high-level professional title, like let's say they're a director or they're a vice president or they're a chief officer or they're a physician or a lawyer. It happens when people assume that they are in a lower level or support role. So people assume that they're like the secretary or the administrative assistant. Maybe they're the nurse or the court reporter. Nothing wrong with these positions, but when the assumption is always that you're a woman, so you must be in a support role, that means that the person who's in a higher level role, their authority is diminished and the weight of their words is diminished because they're not assumed to be in the high-ranking position that they are in. Another term that Leanne Dubinsky and I coined as the term credibility deficit, Mm. in particular happening for the younger women, where they are assumed to not know what they are talking about, (laughs) even when they're the expert. So people will say to them, are you sure that's right? 
or they'll look to a male colleague to second a woman's statement. Again, it's a diminishment of their own expertise. It's an automatic assumption or stereotype that happens. But I say to combat that, we really have to think about, are you just reflexively questioning them or do you have a rationale to back it up? Mm -hmm. If you have a rationale, sure. But if you're just asking them, are you sure? Because it came out of the mouth of a woman, then there's something wrong and it's based on a stereotype. Those two examples, they might sound minor, but they really add up because women have to spend extra time and extra energy to assert their role and establish their credibility. And in our study, it was especially prevalent for the women of color. A few women of color in our study noted how they had to give a summary of their resume anytime that they met somebody new in order to establish their credibility. I think so many women can personally relate to that feeling of Mm -hmm. needing to establish no, no, I am the boss in the room. Like, Mm -hmm. this Mm -hmm. is me. I'm not the secretary. There's nobody higher than me to make this decision. And I wonder when we talk about the credibility deficit, Mm -hmm. as women feel like they may need to overcompensate Mm -hmm. to make up for that credibility Mm -hmm. deficit, is that also harming how they show up and how they can be your professional and fall into that likability trap if they're also trying to prove their worth in meetings? Yeah, for sure. The man walks into the meeting and he just starts talking, right? And he's assumed that he knows what he's talking about. If the woman has to go into the meeting and she has to say, I've got XYZ degrees and I've got an X number of years of experience and this is a short version of my resume, it can sound like she is overcompensating to somebody who's looking at, here's the man, here's the woman who both show up in the same space. And she has to, again, not only spend that extra time and extra energy, but then it can come with that misperception of, Why is she going into a whole thing about her background when nobody else is? But she knows that if she doesn't, her words may not be perceived with the same authority as the man who can just show up and have that happen for him automatically. So it's really a catch-22 where she's damned as she does and damned as she doesn't. We're going to have to start every Zoom meeting just flashing our LinkedIn for a, you know five brief seconds so we all can understand everyone's experience and move on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> So let's talk about what's at stake here. Most of us should know that racial diversity leads to better business outcomes and more creative teams. Mm -hmm. How does age diversity overall contribute to a business's bottom line? Well, age diversity is similar to the other types of diversity. They all help businesses' bottom line. The consumer market consists of people of all ages. And if you want to grow your business, then you really need people of various ages who understand the needs and desires of each generation. The inverse would be constraining your business and your earnings by discriminating against people in your workforce who are of various ages by only having people who are young or who are middle-aged or only having women in the support roles where they're not able to ascend to the decision-making roles, then that impedes the ability of their voices to be heard. And it also hurts in terms of sustaining a business in terms of like succession planning. Mm -hmm. So everybody should have the opportunity to decide for themselves when they're ready to retire, right? Right. And when they do, you want to have people of various ages and experiences in the ranks ready to move up and take the reins. And But let's be real. This is already happening for men. Men are being groomed to take over and advance through the pipeline. But we all know that the pipeline for women is super leaky. And one reason of this is the age-related excuses to not hire and promote them throughout their career when they're young, when they're middle-aged, and of course, when they're older. Corporate boards also suffer from a lack of age diversity. The average age of a board director in the United States is actually 63. So on one hand, we want board members to be knowledgeable and very experienced, but I can't help think about how we're missing opportunities by leaving out younger voices. Well, certainly. Often you think of boards being the older, more seasoned people, and often it's the older, more seasoned white men who are on so many of our boards. And The board is in control over the organization, and you really want your board to have the same type of diversity as your leadership teams and should exist throughout your organization so that the board, as they're discussing things, can have a variety of perspectives and, in theory, should be open to making sure that everybody has a voice and everybody's perspective is heard and considered. But to that end, we need to make sure that our boards are diverse and age diversity matters on boards as well. Yeah. Again, in particular for the women. How can we recognize when we are being ageist against women at any age? How does that show up? And how can we check ourselves in the workplace when we see that bias? So I have a really easy tip. In a recent Fast Company article, my two co-authors, again, Leanne Dubinsky and Amber Stevenson, we suggested an approach called flip it to test it. 
This approach was developed by Kristen Pressner, and it's really simple, and it can actually be used for any criticism of a woman, but let's say you have an age-related criticism, such as she's 28 years old and she's too young to lead this new unit. So what you do is you flip it to say he's 28 years old and he's too young to lead this unit. It sounds different, right? Like, would we say the same thing about a man who's 28 years old as we would a woman? And it's just a thought process to run through your mind before you say something to think, this is the way I'm thinking about this person. Would I think the same way about a man? Another example would be this particular woman might have kids and she then won't want to work. Would you say that about a man? He might have kids and then he won't want to work? Probably not. (laughs) So it's just a really powerful and easy tool anytime, you know, that you're thinking about your own biases and your own thought processes when you're evaluating a person for a job, evaluating a woman for a job or a promotion or for a new assignment or an opportunity, and you're thinking, oh, maybe this woman's not the right fit or whatever, run this through your mind and really think about why are you thinking that? What are the reasons? And again, would you think the same thing about a man? I love that. Flip it to test it. Flip it to test it. Yep. (laughs) What are some of those sneaky ways that ageism can show up in the office? How can I use flip it to test it? I imagine hiring decisions, Mm -hmm. doling out assignments. Yeah. So you certainly would use flip it to test it in any of those scenarios. And the other thing I want to mention about hiring decisions, succession planning, doling out assignments is that Of course, ageism against women shows up in all of the above. But these discussions, they often happen when the woman is not in the room. And so she has no ability to advocate for herself because she's just not there. Mm. So gendered ageism can show up by considering a woman to be, for example, too young for a role or having children and so not being considered for certain assignments, especially those involving travel. Or perhaps the woman is middle-aged and so she's not considered in succession planning because she's already considered too old. Or sometimes people consider women of that age to be difficult to work with. We saw that in our research. When women become middle-aged, many of us, we lose our fear of speaking our mind, okay? So maybe when we're young, we feel the constraints and we feel like, oh, I shouldn't push back. But as women get older, they just get over it and they get tired of it, right? And they finally are like, I've maybe attained something in my career. I'm finally going to speak my mind. But unfortunately, we know that certain men, in particular insecure men, don't like that. And so they don't like the pushback from women of any age. And so they would consider her too difficult to work with and then therefore not consider her for promotion or succession planning or anything like that. And then, of course, older women are seen as not having value or not being worth investing in. So perhaps an older woman is allowed to stay in her current role, but is not considered for advancement, even if she's the person who's most suitable. We talk about the biases against women at any age. And for whatever reason, I think, oh, well, men are committing these crimes against women. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I have to imagine that women are also treating women like this. Yes. Are there studies that validate that the call is coming from inside the house? Yeah, yeah. We saw this in our research, too, where some of the women mentioned it wasn't just the men who were exhibiting the ageism against women. And we talk about this in Glass Walls. We call it female hostility, which is made up of queen bee behavior and mean girl behaviors. And so queen bee behavior is when a woman at the top fails to promote or actively blocks opportunities for junior women. And the mean girl behavior occurs between people who are women who are peers or like lower level. What's common between both of these and in all forms of female hostility is that the women are acting from a place of insecurity. So they've been in this male normed workplace They've maybe attained a certain level, a certain status, and they are made to feel insecure in the sense that there's only room for so many of them. But in particular, the queen bee syndrome. This woman's made it to the top. She knows there's only room for one of her. (laughs) If another one ascends, she has to fall. And so she's working to maintain her hard-earned turf, so to speak. I say it never excuses the behavior, but it does help if you understand where it's coming from, that it's really a symptom or a consequence of the discrimination that these women have experienced. The other thing I always say about female hostility is it's not the majority of women. I mean, there's one study that I know of that was actually conducted in the country of Brazil, and it looked at if women were in those roles where they had decision-making authority, were women underneath them being promoted? And the case was, if you look on the whole, yes, they were promoting the more junior women. But the thing that makes the female hostility really stand out to us is because as women, we expect other women to support us, right? We're all women. We should all have this shared solidarity as women. And so I expect you, Lindsay, to support me. I'll support you. If that doesn't happen and, you know, the woman is coming after us, then it's more surprising and it's more jarring than if it happens from a man. So it's not good if it happens from anybody. But when it happens and it's a woman, 
it can just be more surprising and it can feel more hurtful than when it's a man. And it sounds like women who are alone in a sea of men have internalized Mm -hmm. a lot of that oppression in the workplace. And it's not that they are born with hostility to other women. It's just that's how they navigated their career. And it's led them to a place where they have reflected that hostility back to other women. Yeah, that's exactly right. I always get this question of what do you do if you're dealing with someone who's acting with queen bee behaviors? I don't like to label people queen bees or anything like that, but it's a label for the behavior. (laughs) And my answer to that is that you try to connect with them on a personal level, try to establish a relationship with them. And I personally have had this happen in my career. I've dealt with women who have exhibited this behavior. And while this hasn't worked for every woman, it's worked with some where I've gone and tried to establish a relationship with her to say, hey, we've got mutual goals here in terms of advancing our organization. How can we work together? And I found that I've been able to make progress with some of these women to have a better working relationship after I went and addressed it head on rather than ignoring it. And so I don't like to put the responsibility on the people who are what would be considered the victims of the hostility. But I always get asked that question, what do you do if you run into somebody that's a woman that's really just acting with hostility or blocking your opportunities. And to try to establish a relationship is the best approach there. I love that. Yeah. And you wrote for Harvard Business Review that intergenerational Mm -hmm. mixed gender teams can present a solution. How can that approach foster stronger professional relationships at any age? Certainly mixed gender and mixed generational teams are going to be best for your organization no matter what the team is. And if you think about it, again, you want to have all different types of voices at your table and you want to make sure that you're listening to all these different voices, that nobody is shut down, that everybody has a voice, that everybody feels free to bring their perspective. And having these mixed gender and mixed generational teams will, first of all, help you to surface all sorts of ideas that will help grow your organization or grow your business. And it will also help in terms of helping establish relationships between these individuals. So as they're on a team with somebody who's older than them, somebody who they maybe wouldn't naturally connect with in a workplace just because they're of different ages, like this gives them that opportunity certainly to establish even just collegial relationships or mentoring relationships, sponsorship relationships. It's just really a good approach that when you're putting together a team, do the best you can to think about how can I make the team as diverse as possible and make sure you're including gender and age in your consideration for diversity on your team. Absolutely. Well, this podcast is called The New Rules of Business. So we always ask our guests if you could write a new rule for business. And Amy, for you, maybe this rule prevents ageism for women at all ages. What would the new rule be? Well, the new rule is simple. It would just be train all employees on gendered age bias. Train them on how to recognize it and how to prevent it. So unfortunately, ageism is still an acceptable and normalized form of bias. If you think about how age-related jokes and even just commenting on people's age is still so common and certainly common at work. And so while gender bias and racism have been the focus of most DEI initiatives, Age bias has been largely ignored, and we really need to get it in front of everyone so that they can stop themselves from making age-related assumptions and so that they can call it out when they hear others making age-related assumptions. All right. Final question. Uh You can choose what is either the Uh best or worst piece Uh of leadership advice you've ever received. Yeah. So I'm going to go with one that was best and worst at the same time. Okay. (laughs) I was told once by a male boss that while I was a manager, I wasn't a leader. There really wasn't advice. It was just him telling me that he didn't see me as a leader. And this happened earlier in my career. But I I look back on that and there were a couple of things going on. And as I think about it, I was actually exhibiting lots of leadership. But I turned that around to say that was really the best advice also, because his comment really made me think about what's the difference between management and leadership. And it really made me ponder and take some steps towards how could I become a more visible leader? It was many years ago, but it still sticks with me today. And it really was the impetus for my growth as a leader in my career. Amazing story Mm -hmm. and great advice. And I'm actually thinking about the times I have had that conversation about managing versus leading. And I think if it's not framed in a way that can showcase what great leadership looks like, it's not really good advice. Right. I mean, the thing is, is that people, I think they assume that 
leadership only happens in one particular way or maybe a set of particular ways. And women, I think, are leading in lots of ways that are being discounted. And I could go into a whole other topic about invisible contributions and office housework and different things where, you know, women's work and their leadership is just not, it's happening, but it's not being recognized or rewarded. And so, again, this comment really made me start to think about those types of things. Amy, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Lindsay. That was Dr. Amy Deal, author of Glass Walls. I personally resonated with her definition of role incredulity, where younger women at work are assumed to be in a lower support role because of their age. And I could think back several moments, especially earlier in my career, where I had to make it clear that I was actually the one in the room with the authority to make the final decision. Not the dude, not the guy to my left, but me. (laughs) Yeah. And I love how she talks about credibility deficit where younger women are assumed to not know what they're talking about, even when they are the ones that are the subject matter experts. Oh, yeah. I'm sure every woman can raise their hand when asked if they've ever had to spend extra time and energy asserting their role and establishing their credibility in the workplace. I know I can. So unfortunately, Lindsay, it looks like we have our answer to the big question that we posed at the top of the episode. And that is, there is no right age to be a woman at work. (sighs) I knew it. I think we all knew it. (laughs) Well, all of this, as Amy points out, is really a guise for the underlying sexism women face in the workplace. Whereas men are usually seen as leaders, regardless of their age, women are often first seen as the caretakers of the home and have less credibility in their professional lives. I love her flip it to test it concept that she brought up in the conversation because it really forces you to assess whether or not the concerns and questions you have about a potential candidate or someone on your team, are they valid or are they really just rooted in a bias? So if you're debating if a mom with young kids can handle a big assignment like me, flip it and ask yourself, would I have the same concerns about a father on my team? Or if you're worried about whether a woman in her 20s is too young for that promotion, flip it. Ask yourself, do I think the same thing about that younger guy on my team? And the answer is probably not. Exactly, Linz. Like, can Carolyn Childers handle reading the credits? Flip it to test it. I don't think you're using that right. And I've got this. All right. (laughs) (laughs) Roll the credits. And I think that is a perfect way for us to end this episode of the New Rules of Business by Chief. Don't miss out on all of our Chief content. You can get more podcast episodes by following the New Rules of Business on your favorite podcast app. And if you want to learn more about Chief, head to chief.com. Chief is the most powerful community for senior executive women designed to create meaningful connections with fellow executive leaders that'll unlock transformative outcomes for your career. Thanks to Sharon Yee, Courtney Conley, Mercy Harper, and Mesa Melton at Chief, and to our entire production team, Pod People. Our music is by Colin Hatch. I'm Carolyn Childers. And I'm Lindsay Kaplan. Thanks again for listening. I have to ask, Amy, what is mm-hmm. your take on those like 30 under 30 lists, 40 under 40, 50 over 50? Do we like celebrating people for their age? Or is it a weird way to almost fetishize youth and aging. I guess if you're an organization and you've got these lists, the thing I would think about is, are you only doing the list for people of certain ages? Or do you have a list for 60 over 60? It's good to celebrate people. And if that's a way to celebrate them, that's fine. Just as long as you're not only doing it 30 under 30. And like you said, fetishizing youth, you're doing it for people across the age spectrum. Let's be fair and equitable about our listicles this year. Yes, yes, please. (laughs) 